She gambled. She lost. What happens now? Welcome to Question Time. And on our panel here in London tonight, the man who ran Theresa May's campaign for the Tory leadership, the Transport Secretary Chris Grayling, Labour's Shadow Attorney General Shami Chakrabarti, the author and former political editor of the Sunday Times and the Daily Mail, Isabel Oakeshott, the comedy writer who created the television series The Thick of It, Armando Iannucci, and the man often thought to have inspired that belligerent spin doctor Malcolm Tucker, Tony Blair's former spokesman, Alistair Campbell. Good, thank you very much. Uh, good to see you all here. Remember, if you're at home, you can join in. You can use Twitter and Facebook, our hashtag BBCQT, text 83981, push the red button to see what others are saying. And our first question comes from Tony Marie Jarvis, please. Last night showed Theresa May has no mandate. Should she resign? Alistair Campbell. Uh, well, she has a mandate in that she's been to see the Queen and the Queen has agreed that she can form a government and she's decided to form a government uh, propped up by the, the DUP in Northern Ireland. I would perhaps ask the question, does she have any authority? And I think she has lost authority by, to quote David from the start of the programme, taking an enormous gamble for entirely party and selfish interest and putting the country into possibly a period of, of near chaos. And also, I am really, really worried about the deal that she has done to stay in power. Because the DUP uh, are a party in Northern Ireland that did very well in the election. But one of the most important things that I think is in, at some risk at the moment because of all the sort of chaos and confusion in our politics, is the Northern Ireland peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. And she has gone into bed with a party from which previous governments, including the government led by John Major, have always stayed studiously neutral. OK, I, I'm not going to stop you there, but we're going to come to it. We've got a okay, question. Fine, sorry. But so, should so she resign? Is I, I, I think that uh, she doesn't have to resign. She, she can govern. But I don't think she'll be able to govern for long. But and I think because she has fundamentally weakened herself in the eyes of the public, in the eyes of her party, who have fairly stark regicidal tendencies when they have losing leaders, <laughs> and also at a time we're going into this, the most important negotiations of any prime minister since the Second World War, she is losing authority in the eyes of those with whom she's going to have to negotiate. Okay. So I think she's a busted flush. Chris Grayling. Well, no, she shouldn't resign. Um, you have to remember, first of all, uh, we won the most seats. She won the largest vote share that a Conservative Prime Minister or leader has won for a generation. Uh, she won more votes than Tony Blair did in 1997. Uh, what's happened is that the votes have fallen in a different way. We've ended up with a, a narrow result. Uh, of course, I'm disappointed that we didn't do better in terms of the seat outturn, but she nonetheless commands more members of parliament uh, today than all of the other parties except the DUP and Sinn Féin put together. And so therefore, not only must she not resign, she has to not resign in the interest of the country because we need to move forward. We've got to go into the Brexit negotiations. We've got to deliver the right outcome for Britain. Uh, and as the person who commands the, the, the largest bloc in parliament, it's absolutely right and proper that she should stay. So is she safe well. for the entire duration of a parliament? Will she fight the next election for you and your party? Well, that, the next election is a question for her. But my view is that we need her to stay as prime minister and stay as prime minister uh, for the foreseeable future. But hang on a second. You actually supported her as leader of the yes. party. So you must have a view about whether having lost an election, having gambled on the election, having lost her majority, she should now fight the next election for the Tories? Or is it just an interim prime minister you're talking about? Uh, what I'm talking about is somebody who commands the biggest bloc in parliament as we start the most important negotiations for a generation. The last thing she should be doing is stepping away. And actually, the last thing any of us should be doing is discussing, is she going to be here in 6, 12, 18, 5 years' time or whatever? Why can't it be we discussed? Need, we need her to Why get on with discussed? We need her to get on with delivering those Brexit negotiations now, providing steady and consistent government for the UK. All right. Not strong and stable, though. 
<laughs> Sami Chakrabarti. It was just extraordinary arrogance, as having promised people that there would be no snap election, to call the election, presumably because she'd made a calculation, no doubt on advice, that she would get a landslide. She took people for granted. And frankly, the way that she conducted her campaign took people for granted as well, including not doing debates and so on, and including the, the very negative campaigning, which we've come to associate with Mr. With Mr. Crosby, who ran a really nasty smear um, campaign against Sadiq Khan in London. should she go? You're describing a campaign which has been much described. Well, I mean, should it, she go? What's interesting is that, obviously, obviously not Chris, but, but other senior Conservatives like Anna Soubry have been saying she needs to consider her position because mm. we've lost all these colleagues. Well, Anna would say that, wouldn't she, because she lost her seat. Well, I mean, I think we shouldn't beat about the bush here. This is an absolute disaster. Yep. It is a disaster, yep. but it's not a question of whether should she resign. She actually can't resign. That's you right. have She's to think trapped. through the mechanics of what would happen now if there's a Tory leadership contest. There's not going to be a coronation. There is nobody waiting in the wings to be an amazing party leader, an amazing prime minister for us. We are stuck with her. We can't afford weeks. We can't afford weeks of the Tories having a conversation about who they want while the clock ticks on the Brexit negotiations. So she's not just very got to get on with it. inspiring leadership. I hear what you say. We I are where we are. So Anna Soubry didn't yep. lose her no, seat, by the way. Did she not? No. no. She has many colleagues that lost their seats, and, 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 and that's You, sir, up there. Yes, let's hear your view, and let's hear some members of the audience. Yes, what do you think? Yeah, you say you don't get rid of her, but she's clearly incompetent, mm. and you turns to every opportunity. I'd much rather have a leader who knew what they were doing and were mm. consistent with the public. Yeah, she hasn't been consistent with the public. OK, and the man up there at the back. Yes. Mm. And I'll come to you too. Yes, you, sir, at the very back there. The election campaign was about Brexit. When are we going to get moving on to Brexit instead of talking about leadership campaigns, a new leadership campaign? We've had an election, let's get on and move on and get the process of Brexit out of the way. You think it was about Brexit, this election? Well, yes, it was. It, that's what what it, was the evidence for that? It was strong and stable and she wanted to go in there and get a bigger majority. But she didn't get it. Well, no, she didn't get it. Well, that's what she wanted. Amanda Inucci. And she didn't discuss what her position was on Brexit, other than saying that she just needed more votes and more seats, as if somehow 27 other countries were going to be a little bit more frightened of her because she had 60 more seats. And that didn't happen. Um, I agree. I agree. She shouldn't resign today. That will happen in, in such good time, in her own good time. That will happen. But it's what she did today, given the position she's in. Mm. You know, in a crisis, you find out the mettle of someone. Mm. What she did today was be absolutely tone deaf to what happened last night. Because the votes were split across the country, the parties were split across the country, and I think the mood, really, from the country, especially with all those participating in the election for the first time, is yeah. we want some kind of consensus. We want some kind of reaching out across the aisles and to the other parties. What she's done is what she's been doing for the last two years, which is retreating yep. to her default position and only huddling with those who she thinks she agrees with and, and will agree with her. She, she's gone for hard Brexit and the country said, no, that has completely confused us, that's frightened us, you didn't talk to us about hard Brexit, we want a further discussion. And then what she's done is she's gone into right. number 10 with those who say she'll, they'll, they'll support hard Brexit. And it's completely tone deaf to what's going on in the country. Chris Grayling, tone deaf. Oh, well, I don't think so. But of course we've got to learn lessons. Um, yeah, we did not do as well as we'd hoped. Well, she didn't say we that would be, We would need, mm. of course, we need to, to learn lessons from that. And also, I think we also ought to pause for a moment to think of a lot of members of Parliament, actually on both sides, who lost their seats last night. Uh, a huge change for them, a huge disappointment for us who are still there, losing many valued colleagues. But of course, we've got to learn the lessons. And what lessons uh, have you got to learn? Well, I think we need to look back at the campaign, look at what we did, look at the messages, and think about how we make sure in the future that we do better than we did last night. Can you pick out any particular element in the campaign that needs to be <laughs> investigated? I'm Where going to take the time to, to, to look through and think about things, but actually at the same time we've got to get on with those Brexit uh, okay. negotiations what? and deliver the right outcome. Okay, why don't we learn a lesson from what the DUP did for the last six or seven years, which is go into a partnership with Sinn Féin? There are other parties and people she could have spoken to other than just the DUP. Why, why didn't she reach out? If Brexit is the biggest issue facing this country since the Second World War, why didn't she reach out to other parties and say, OK, I've got the message, 
We're very divided on this issue, so why don't we have an all-party group? She doesn't even bring that to people within her own party. <laughs> OK, no. let, me, let me take a couple of more points. We've got, yes, the woman in pink there, you. And I'll go to the questioner if I can. Yes, the woman in pink there. Uh, come, come along there, in pink. There we are. She well was done. never passionate about Brexit. She's a Remainer. She's never going to be able to negotiate with any conviction. And what do you think she should do? Stay there? Stay? She needs to stay for the continuity of the government, for the continuity of the country, for now. But she'll be pushed out if she doesn't go herself voluntarily. And, and Tony Marie Jarvis, who asked the question, what's your view? I think she should resign. I fully expected her to, because I feel like she only called the general election to kind of validate her own self as mm. Prime Minister. And she's ended up with a hung parliament. She doesn't have a Tory majority anymore. Uh, so I feel like that was the failure, and it was her failure. OK, let's stick... A uh, number of hands up. Let's stick with the topic, but just have a different angle on it. From Deborah Littley, please. Um, how can the Conservatives align themselves with a party whose values go against our own laws and values? So, uh, she, uh, she's, a, she's a minority government. She's said she's going to do a deal with the DUP. Let's just have a look at that. And... Uh, Alice Campbell, you were talking about that. Do you just want to <coughs> emphasise the point you made and then I'll go around the table on it? Well, I, I really, really do have a worry about this. Uh, when John Major was weak uh, and he could have done a deal with the DUP, he absolutely steadfastly, for very good principled reasons, said, I'm not doing that. Because he didn't want to be in hoc mm -hmm. to that party when the government... We have a situation at the moment in Northern Ireland where there's been a political crisis where they're trying to get the administration back up, yeah. and where the government is the mediator, our government is the mediator with the Irish government between the DUP and Sinn Féin. How can our government be the mediator when the DUP are going to be part of our government? And she's playing fast and loose with the, on Brexit with Margaret Thatcher's biggest achievement, which was the single market, and now on this with Gordon... With, uh, John Major and Tony Blair's greatest achievement, which was the peace process in Northern Ireland. She is putting that at risk with a sordid, disgraceful, dangerous deal. Chris, Chris Graham? Well, the first thing is I think that's completely wrong. Um, we have had initial discussions wrong, with the uh, DUP. The we will see where we end up. Uh, but we have got today more seats in the House of Commons than Labour, the Liberal Democrats, the SNP, the Greens and the Welsh Nationalists put together. Uh, okay. Only the SNP, uh, only Sinn Féin and the DUP take you over the halfway line. So we're going to have sensible conversations with the DUP. They are in power in Northern Ireland. They are used to working with other parties. They work alongside all of the Northern Ireland parties in the Northern Ireland Assembly, the Northern Ireland Administration. Not at the moment, though. Well, that they have a long experience of working with other parties, and there's nothing unusual now in today's Britain in parties working together. We don't but have to Chris, agree with them. Chris, we we, we don't have to agree with everything that they say. We don't have to agree with them. But what do you say to Alistair's really central point, which it seems to me is how can you broker the peace between two sides when one side is propping you up? You're in hock to one side. How can you be? And you're going broker? to be in hock to them on Brexit as well, because they're the only pro-Brexit party in Northern Ireland. How does can, that work? Can, can I just read you? Can I just pause a moment to read you something Theresa May said in 2015 about the possibility of a Labour SNP deal? I think people are genuinely concerned about the prospect of the SNP calling the shots. Hmm. In constitutional terms, the shots would be called by somebody who wouldn't be even be in Parliament, meaning Nicola Sturgeon. The leader of the DUP is not in oh, Parliament. Mm -hmm. well, Game, set and match. Let's see what the nature of the... <laughs> what the nature of the work of the is. The early stages of the discussions... What have you uh, said so far in your discussions? Well, that, I'm not going to comment on that on live television. I think we'll leave the Prime Minister... Is it not for us to know? It's not about is it, democracy is it, is it or government or anything think, like that. What kind think, of discussions I, I, I are you I think having? we're not going to have that discussion on question time tonight. Uh, I'm going to leave it to the Prime Minister and the <laughs> DUP to decide how best they might work together and then they can talk to the country about it. All right. I mean, I think it would, like it would clearly be incredibly unfortunate if one of the terrible prices for this absolute cock-up by Theresa May was any kind of risk to the peaceful situation in Northern mm. Ireland and all the hard work that has gone into that. But, and it's a big but, 
we are where we are and when you go into some kind of agreement with another party compromises have to be made and I would like to see the focus on where we are today and where we're going in the future rather than raking over the past of the various characters involved. Let me just go to one or two members of the audience. The woman there and then there was somebody who had their hand up here I'll come to. Yes. Surely one of the issues is that it's actually a problem with the, our political system today is that rather than people working together on what is one of the most serious issues that we've got facing us, which is Brexit, and actually all the parties working together on this, people are forced into these alliances which are truly unsuitable, mm. but ha they have no other choice. But, that's, no. but can I just say, David, yeah. that, that, this, this is the point. To, this is the whole point about Theresa May's approach to, to, to the referendum, to, to Brexit. She came out of that referendum, and I don't agree with the lady in pink. I think that she's a, a Brexiteer who pretended to be a Remainer. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that what she's done, she has decided to align herself with the 48% and the 52% can get lost. And that is how she's pursuing this hard Brexit policy. All right, let me hear from some more. I'll come to you two in a moment. You said in the blue shirt. And I'll go to you up there. Yes. Um, I'm old enough to remember when it was the Conservative and Unionist Party. So I don't understand why the DUP are being painted as such aliens. Aren't they just Irish Conservatives and always have been? No, but my, my, no, my point is the party... Uh, so let, let's sure, that, that's the Unionist Party who oh. won no seats, but the DUP is far more extreme in certain views. Two things I want to pick up, two arguments that we've heard that I just want us to be aware of and analyse. One is... To say that you, the Conservatives are the largest party, got the no largest number of seats and largest number of votes, and therefore they're entitled to govern, is exactly the argument that Nicola Sturgeon used last night in Scotland. And, and, and all the rhetoric coming from London is, that doesn't work. She lost. So you can't apply that argument to the Conservative Party at the same time. There has to be a reaching out beyond just the Conservatives and the DPU to a far wider consensus. The other thing is the question, I want to question the premise behind the question, which is there's a deal. There hasn't been a deal. Mm. Mm. That's the problem. She's gone ahead and formed a government without arranging mm. anything yeah, in the absolutely. DUP, which means they can ask for anything, and she's the one who thinks she's best placed to negotiate Brexit. Absolutely. That's right, isn't it? At the moment, it's a minority <coughs> government. It's not even a coalition with the DUP where they can set out their joint well, stall. So Arlene yeah, Foster, the leader of the DUP, said this afternoon yeah. that she wanted to operate a work in a way mm. that gave us stability for the future uh, and that surely is what we yeah, want now we're going to the yeah. brexit negotiations we want to be able to govern properly and deliver the right outcome for britain Let, let's hear some more measures the, the young man in blue there you yes a point to chris grayling like surely this is a supply and demand this, this is not a coalition in any way how can you be confident that the dup will stay so you think it's a perilous deal to, to make oh. in the first place. Yeah. I think it'll all be over in six months. Well, they hold the revolver. Let's be clear about that. They hold the revolver. Well, also, listen, Chris Grayling, do you want to... No, hold on. Sorry. Chris Grayling, do you want to answer? Well, as I said, you know, we're in the early stages of discussion, so I don't think it's possible to simply say that is what the agreement is, because the agreement hasn't been done yet. We've had initial discussions. The DUP have said very clearly that they want to help secure stability of government, uh, and I'm grateful to them for saying that. Uh, but we've got to work through in discussions with them about how that might work. Okay, so, so, so I've had happen. a lot of dealings with the DUP, working with Tony Blair on the peace process. They are tough. They are going to drive a very, very hard bargain. And like the 27 leaders in Europe, they have seen they're not dealing with somebody who's strong and stable. They're mm -hmm. dealing with somebody who caves. And they are going to have her around her little their little finger. And frankly, I think they've already got her there by the speed with which she's done this today. But yeah. Alistair and Shami, I just wonder what you think the alternative here is. I mean, I thought it was absolutely extraordinary to see Jeremy Corbyn coming out this morning saying that he was ready to lead the government. <laughs> 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 My point is that he has yeah. almost 60 less seats than the Conservatives, so how can he possibly have either the moral or numerical right to do that? Well, well, no, I mean, he, well, wait, <laughs> the constitutional position which is that Theresa May has the most seats and she's the incumbent Prime Minister it's for her to have the first attempt at forming this government but he was also right as the leader of the opposition on the ascendance who effectively won if anybody won that election it was him he was also well, right to set he got 260 oh. seats and the Conservatives got 318 yeah, seats of, of course, but, but, given, but given what he's achieved what given what he's achieved he gained 29 seats look, fine yeah. just but because he starts at a low base let's have a say.
just explain explain he, his victory. He is right to he is just right constitutionally to say that if she is unable to form a, a, a government, he it's his duty as leader of the opposition to attempt to form an alternative government, and he's right in that. Well, I'm sure we're all very grateful, but it doesn't mean anything. Well, being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, but David, when, you can be when, as sarcastic in, as you like, but back that doesn't when the help Tory Lib Dem coalition started. Gordon Brown was the incumbent Prime Minister, didn't have the numbers to form majority, and yes, there, were, there was a process of five days. They didn't have to wrap it up in ten minutes. So what do you yeah. think she should do? Well, I, think she, I don't think she should have rushed so precipitately into this particular... What's the alternative? I think the alternative was, was actually for her to come out and signal a different approach to Brexit, actually yeah. possibly to have indicated <laughs> that she could have talked to the other parties. Yeah. And I hope actually now that, that uh, Shami's leader, Jeremy, that Jeremy Corbyn, will actually step into that space and say, we can start to try to put together with the other parties an understanding of what we're doing in Brexit. What she did on the step of number 10 today, she went straight back to saying what she said at the start. Right. Only I can deliver this. I've got a mandate, even though she just lost a majority, back to work. The, the, the woman in the third Mandates. row there. Yes. Um, taking this back to the DUP, Chris just said there that there's nothing unusual about parties working together. Mm -hmm. What is unusual is that we have a party like the DUP, which is anti-same-sex marriage, which denies climate change at the forefront of British politics, and I am absolutely petrified at the prospect of such a coalition of chaos and worried about the direction which they're going to take our country. I'm, I'm, t I'm terrified about that. Okay. Description of the DUP. Part parties work together, often disagreeing significantly about issues that are important to one or the other. I mean, Sinn Féin and the DUP work side by side in Northern Ireland, or have done in the administration there. Um, we worked with the Liberal Demo Democrats for five years. We didn't always agree with each other on them. The yep. fact is, I fundamentally disagree with the DUP about same-sex marriage, but same-sex marriage is now part of the way of life in, uh, in England, Wales, Northern she's Ireland. Picked I, I, she's picked the DUP. Right, um, it's she not in Northern to, Ireland she, yet. I suspect it will be in due course. She came out to Downing Street today and said she wanted to govern in the national interest, which sounds slightly conciliatory sounds like you're looking for a consensus so, so that's why she has this dysfunction between what she says and what she does that she's not going to call an election yes she is going to call an election that she's for remain no she's for brexit that she's uh, going to speak to everyone no no she's going to huddle with the, the dup yeah all right uh, i just take a few more hands there's a hand up there that man you say with the beard and then i go behind there and then we'll take another question yes the DUP's nonsense is usually confined to Belfast, uh, to Northern Ireland, and the thought of it having a global platform and a coalition is really quite terrifying. What price do you think the DUP would be asking Mr Grayling and his colleagues um, to pay? As you, as you said, they're pretty pro-Brexit, and the thought of a hard border in Ireland again is also pretty, pretty upsetting. They're pro-Brexit, <laughs> they're pro-Brexit, and they say a frictionless border. Well, none of us want a hard border in Ireland, uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Uh, nor does the European Union, uh, and I'm very confident we will end up with an arrangement that makes sure that doesn't happen. OK, the man in pale blue there, uh, in the second and third row from the back. What does the panel think of the argument that the reason Theresa May called for the election to get a greater majority was to stop the hard Brexiteers in the ranks of the Tory party? From forcing to, give it, to give herself a big enough majority. Well, Don't okay, let's, take, well, let's go on to that. We'll take a question mm -hmm. on it from Jonathan Dokes. Jonathan Dokes. Will June 9th, 2017, be remembered as the day Brexit died? <laughs> well. Wow. All right, um, uh, Amanda Unucci. Well, there's a last minute gasp of hard Brexit resuscitation from Theresa May, the DUP, today. I, I mean, I go back to my point, which is we didn't vote for hard Brexit. Oh, we voted God. for Brexit. I agree with that. I, you know, I, I, I disagree on the. The campaign to have another referendum. I think it, you know, it insults the 52% who voted for Brexit. But we didn't vote for the specifics. We didn't decide what kind of Brexit we wanted, what we wanted to do with our borders, what levels we wanted to put on immigration. All those are to be discussed. And my beef with Theresa May is that having gone to the country to discuss Brexit, but then refused to do so, but talk about the bins with her husband on, on the one show instead. Mm. And, and therefore, to keep quiet on the one thing she wanted to have a conversation with us about, I think now it's incumbent on her to, to open up and to say it didn't work. This Look, country is not a hard Brexit supporting country. I think and one, one alternative I do suggest, I'm just throwing it out there, is if, if we do have a negotiating team made up of members of the main parties, we put our kind of uh, differences aside for like two years, do the deal, and then have another election, and then we can say. <laughs> I 
think there's a really cynical operation underway here on the part of Remainers to try to pretend that last night's result was some kind of verdict on Brexit. Now, although mm. Theresa yep. May called the election ostensibly to get a greater mandate on Brexit, one of the weird things about the campaign is that Brexit was hardly talked about at all. And in fact, if you look at the results from That's last night... she didn't talk about it. If she you has look, no plan. She <laughs> wanted a blank If check. you look at That's the results from last night, election. some of the loudest voices on Remain, like Nick Clegg, lost their seats. And Alistair, you spent much of the campaign moaning about how no one was talking about Brexit. So how can you now say that, for some reason, no, this is now you. a verdict on it, Brexit? I tell you, I'm not saying it was a verdict on Brexit, but Brexit was an issue. One of the most extraordinary... Uh, I don't know what's, whether it's been announced yet with Kensington and Chelsea, but if Labour win that, don't tell me that that isn't a big... Labour have won it, yes. Right, a big pro-Remain protest vote. But what because about it Zach is. Goldsmith? Yes, He's exactly. Back. It's He's a back. complicated He's a picture. He's a Brexiteer. Let, let's, no, but hang on. Uh, let's come back to the crucial point. You made the point, Isabel, quite rightly, that uh, the Prime Minister said she wanted stable, secure government in order to negotiate on Brexit. So Chris Grayling, she failed to get that. She's in a minority. And the question Jonathan Dokes asked, does that mean there's going to be a change in attitude towards our negotiations with the EU? You know there are many ways in which you can negotiate with the EU, as Amanda was saying. It doesn't have to be we pull entirely out. Does it, is it going to modify her approach? Well, yes, uh, the question is, it was June the 9th, the day Brexit died. No, yes. not at all. Um, we had well, a depends clear, what you mean by Brexit. A clear referendum. Very hard Brexit, because you haven't got the numbers. Well, I, I, I don't. You haven't got the numbers. I, I do not accept. You haven't got the numbers. I don't accept the concept of Anna, Su Anna Subri is well, back. Okay. I, she's not going to make a difference. Some of the Tories are going to help to stop a hard Brexit I, I, because I, they believe there is no mandate for it. Well, I do not believe. Let, let Chris, let Chris I, I Grayling not, set his stall out. I do not believe in this concept of hard Brexit and soft Brexit. I'm with you on that. Um, <laughs> we voted. We voted to leave the European Union. We voted, in my view, to have the ability to control the flow of people into the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. We voted, I believe, to have good constructive relations with our European neighbours, to have a comprehensive free trade agreement. Uh, all of that requires us to take the approach the Prime Minister set out. There is no magic alternative way. There's no magic way of staying in the single market and limiting the flow of people into the country. And if there's one message that came to me loud and clear out of the referendum is that people want us have to have the ability to control that flow of people. Mm -hmm. So what Theresa May has set out is the only realistic way to pursue a deal with the European Union that works for them, that works for us. It's what we want to have. We want to have a collaborative relationship we want to work together in areas like security and defence, and we want a comprehensive free trade agreement. And I think that's what the overwhelming majority of these pe the people in this country who either voted for Brexit or accept the results of the referendum want. What do you think... <laughs> what, what do you think that the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Ruth Davidson, meant, uh, who did so well in Scotland and who was so admired by the Conservative Party, when she said in a press conference yesterday, we must seek to deliver an open Brexit? Oh, not please. a closed Brexit, <laughs> which, puts our, which puts our country's economic growth first. An open Brexit, not a closed Brexit. Well, Does I, that mean anything at all? I, I, mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I agree with that. I, I did not campaign to leave the European Union for this country to become closed door, uh, erect barricades at Dover, Tax cut itself haven, off from the world. What I want us to be, what, us, what I want us to be, is an outward-facing, globally focused okay. nation trading mm -hmm. with the world. But I do want us outside the political structures and the process of integration that is being driven in Brussels. All right, let me take a couple more points. You say in spectacles, I go to you, and I go to you at the back, and then we'll take another question. I mean, the the vote yeah. yesterday was a vote killing Brexit because the the vote was. Um, the, the, the hard Brexit party's got 44%. They, they got 52 in the last uh, Brexit election. Um, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, but and now this time they got 44%. The, um, the, it's just so obvious that the campaign was not about Brexit. It was about the UK. Brexit vote was about the UK. The whole thing is and you're squabbling about, about the, uh, who wins and who loses. The, the vote yesterday was about the UK and how we govern ourselves. And it's uh, okay. not about... A, and Brexit is going to ruin that. It's going to ruin all of these... All of the people in... in, in it's just going to ruin this country. All right. You, sir, I, I, I'm losing my way among the hands here. You in blue, yes. 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, my request to the Conservative Party would be, uh, even for those remain th those remainers who are now committed to the idea, why don't you come clean with some clear details instead of giving yeah. vacuous cliches like Brexit means Brexit. Also, the 12 point the 12 point plan that Teresa May published. Nine out of those out of them are tautological statements. Mm. All of us we have been waiting for months now yeah. to yeah. come come up with some clarity. Yes, yeah. I was I was a remainer. But now I'm committed to the idea. Give us some details. What do you want? Do you want to close okay. it? Do you want to keep it open? What are your trade policies? Exactly. There's no, no detail so, uh, at all. Sh sh so, sh 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 so you're really onto something. I think Theresa May called that snap election because she was cocky that she was going to get a landslide. Why did she want a landslide? Not because she wanted to unite people and bring all parties together, but, but she thought that the landslide would give her a blank check mm. that would cushion her, A, to just ram through any kind of deal, whether it's popular with the British people or not, and, and, and not share the details with us. And if it went... If it went sour, she thought she'd still have a bit, a bit of a cushion. That has all gone completely wrong. And so, yesterday and today, she should have been doing exactly as people have been saying this evening, and she should have been saying, I called this election to get greater numbers and greater strength. That hasn't happened. I am going to have to change my approach mm. and bring more bring people, people with in. me. All right, the, the man in the middle there, and the country, yes. By the way, I should uh, I just... For the record, I have to correct. I thought that Kensington and Chelsea had, be, had declared it hasn't apparently yet declared. So it's gone to la-la land. <laughs> uh, so, yes. So, um, no party has a majority now. So, I think all parties have a responsibility yeah. to, to reduce Absolutely. the risk that this country has constantly been exposed to. A, a referendum that we didn't really need, uh, a, an election that we didn't really need, constant risk that the risk and uncertainty that their country is being exposed to every party now has a responsibility to get rid of that risk and get the country back on by the rails. doing what exactly that this that's my question <laughs> to ask them what are they but all going I, to do can i just bring in a little bit of reality here last night the vast majority of people who voted around 80 percent or more voted for parties that have said we want to leave the European Union. Both the Tory and the Labour manifesto pledge to leave the EU. So let's not rewrite that. Yeah, and in fact, the written. Labour manifesto it. says it wants an end to free movement. That means coming out of the single market. But the other reality is that she called the election to discuss Brexit. She called it. She said this was about Brexit. And then she didn't discuss it. No, and because she wanted all a blank these, check. And she that, said, all she these... said, robotically, she said, every single vote will strengthen my hand in these negotiations. All right, let, let Chris she's Grayling lost, just answer this She's now point. lost the authority to negotiate. Right. Chris Grayling. Uh, well, I'd say I think Brexit was discussed regularly during the campaign. Uh, and I think the reason, oh, for, no. the, the reason for calling the election was that she found herself in a position where she was subject to the accusation that came from political opponents that she did not have a personal mandate as Prime Minister. She was an unelected no, no. Prime Minister. She, you got to she went for the Conservative Let me just follow the logic of this. <laughs> if she went to the country looking for an endorsement for her views on Brexit and she lost her majority, surely she's lost <laughs> the endorsement of the country for her view on Brexit. <laughs> She is the Prime Minister with the largest block of members of Parliament in the House of Commons, with 43% of the vote, in a Parliament okay. voted overwhelmingly for Brexit. He All said, right. if I lose six seats, then Jeremy Corbyn will be Prime Minister. Well, and he I isn't, Shami, so get over it. All right. so, he will be as rude as he might be. OK, I get we've, got, we've got other things to talk about, because we've been round that a bit. Okay. Uh, just a note, we're going to be in Coventry next Thursday. It's Friday today, I know, and question time is normally on a Thursday. We're in Coventry next Thursday. And the Thursday after that, we're in Plymouth. So if you'd like to come and take part in question time, put questions, argue with the panel. The details are on the screen there of how to do it. I'll give them again at the end. But let's take a, another question uh, and put the boot on another foot. James Van Gogh Searle, please. James Van Gogh Searle. Why are Labour happy about losing another election? Yes, yeah, good question. <laughs> Well, clearly not happy about losing an election, but goodness me, people in this country have shown an appetite for change. <laughs> I, I, 
think, I personally think that something quite extraordinary happened over the past, what, six, seven weeks when, um, when you had all the commentariat and you had Theresa May and her colleagues, you know, completely dismissing Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, the whole party, it was all a joke, it was going to be a, a complete disaster, we were going to be annihilated and look what happened when, when what happened? We got some fair coverage in the broadcast media. There was even a certain David Dimbleby who had said at some stage in the campaign that there hadn't been fair treatment of the Labour leadership in the media. You get mercifully in, during a British uh, elect electoral campaign, which is something to be proud of, a fairer treatment for different parties but you lost, in the media. That's the point. We did, but we made such great. No, of course, we, of course we did. No, I'm not going to. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not. Isabel thinks that I'm running away from the realities. Of course we lost, but we made such gains, and and we ran such a positive campaign, and we did as well as we did because we weren't attacking people and calling their character into question and calling them names. We ran a positive campaign around a manifesto that was incredibly popular. And yes, it was about the NHS and getting rid of tuition fees and and not treating the elderly in the way that's proposed by the government. Okay. Our manifesto was popular, and theirs was not. And you lost. <laughs> and I get it. You say. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm coming to you. Yes. I'm sorry. You not only not lost uh, this uh, uh, election. What actually happened is Labour made this situation now that we have uncertainty and confusion because we did too well. Because what's happened? What's happened is because if nobody believed that you're going to win. Nobody believed that you're going to have majority. What's happened is you stole all the voices, and then what's stole? happened is it, it's complete mess now. <laughs> Uh, Alice Campbell. It's like, it's like, uh, oh, by the way, okay, I, I said in an English English uh, sentence, proper English sentence, it's like a dog in a manger. Don't win and don't let anybody else win. Mm -hmm. And this is what Jeremy is doing. Mm -hmm. He's not winning and so not, not, not giving anybody else win. That's a very strange theory of democracy, okay. sir. That's uh, a very strange theory uh, of democracy. Alice Campbell, uh, 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 by the way, Kensington Chelsea has now been declared and Labour have taken that seat. <laughs> Alice Campbell. <laughs> Mr. Campbell, uh, we have a balanced audience here. Let's fear, hear from those who think that's an error. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, that's the spirit. Thank you, I, Alistair Campbell. The, the, the gentleman who, who asked the question, I actually, um, I, I work with the, the government and the Socialist Party in Albania, which currently has a general election on. And somebody uh, high up in the party sent me a message today, he's covering, watching our election on the television, and said, "Why are the winners?" Uh, looking like losers and the losers looking like winners, mm. which kind of does echo what you're saying. And I think the answer to that is actually about expectations. Theresa May called this election utterly convinced, as Shami said earlier, she was going to get a landslide and she hasn't. Jeremy Corbyn went into this leadership with a lot of critics, myself included, and certainly newspapers like your former paper at the Mail sort of pouring more dirt on him than even we had and we had a I fair bit. I was literally counting the minutes till you had to have a go at them. Well, what was it, 40 minutes? Because you just <laughs> well, I'll tell you the reason. Yourself, I'll tell you the reason why I have a go at so the Daily boring. Mail. Because I think it's a real poison in our democracy, it's that's why. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not small. And I'll tell you it's more. I'm not small, Alistair. <laughs> There's something more. else. There's something I'm else. Small, Alistair. They buy it. They may buy it. And if that's all you care about, fine. But what they also know and I'll tell you what, I've had a lot of criticism of Jeremy Corbyn in my time, and, you know, I'm still, I still have my doubts about the way that the Labour Party is going to go, and we do have to get more people coming from the centre ground and build that coalition to get back into power. What? I'm never happy when Labour lose, ever. And so I want Labour back in so power. So what is it you but... want him to, to, to change? It's important, this on well, policy, because there's, there's... it seems that his policies, the people like you in the Labour Party, were thinking, oh, well, it's, you know, huge spending, get rid of the deficit give the students, you know, yeah. free tuition. You can't afford it. It's just old Labour, you know, giving no, presents to the voters. This, no, what, uh, what, what do you want them to do, actually? This, and, this do you, and do you want Corbyn to stay till the next election? Jeremy Corbyn has had a very, very good campaign, and he's shown that whereas Theresa May cannot campaign, he can campaign, and I think he has strengthened his position considerably. So you keep him as your campaign? <laughs> No, I think he's... Look, I, I'll, tell you what I, I'll tell you what I want to see. I mean, the, I, the ho since the whole sort of Blair-Brown era and people still focus on it, and I just want the Labour Party to get mm. back to where we are an opposition that understands the challenges facing the, the, facing the country and understands that nobody ever wins from just a, a, selection, a section of the electorate. You have to go broad and wide. The other thing I'd really like to see Jeremy Corbyn 
do is actually now, because I think this, a lot of the doubts that stop people voting Labour was this idea that he was not remotely prime ministerial. I think he can step up now on the question of Brexit by doing what Theresa May is refusing to do, and that is actually to start to reach out and talk to other parties about right. that. And I, but I, I just wish we could get over this old Blair, the, the sort of factions and all the rest of it, and start cementing the Labour Party. Well, you wish it. You're the one who's been stirring it up all these years. Well, yeah, a little bit. I accept that. A little no, bit? No, no, actually, it is a little bit, because right. since, since the second leadership election, most of the critics have frankly just shut up and got on. And, and I think what has been shown Jeremy Corbyn has been able to energise people, but what we mustn't run away from, it was actually quite a small swing. There's a lot, lot more to do to get Labour Party back as a party of government with, with a, a credible government that right. these people will vote for. Uh, uh, Chris Grayling, let's just ask Alistair a question. Would you and Tony Blair have been comfortable proposing to the country this Labour manifesto with all the economics behind it and all the numbers uh, and all the issues about borrowing and extra cost that was not met by taxation. And would you have been comfortable with such a huge increase in corporate taxes just at the moment we're about to leave the European Union and we want to attract investment to the United Kingdom? Well, I voted for it. <laughs> uh, I, I, vote, I, vote, I voted for it. I, I voted for it, and I know that Tony Blair voted for it. Would we have done that back in 97, 2001, 2005? I suspect we wouldn't. However, I do think where the Labour yeah. Party is onto something at the moment, and this is the big thing that replaced Brexit at the heart of this campaign, is people are sick to death of austerity it's and being told by the All Tories right. there is no other okay. way. Okay, Alistair, thank you very much. The man there in the one, two, three, the fifth row, yes. You, sir. Yes? Far away. You've got the well, microphone there. Um, I think the only reason that the Labour did so well was because uh, Jeremy Corbyn was offering the, the earth, the world, which he would, couldn't cost. That's Every time right. they were on, they didn't have an answer. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott couldn't answer when they were asked a question about costing. So you say that, that, that that's why he did well? So you're saying the, the they, voters they were gullible? Because the voters you know, were gullible. You don't respect the people that voted for the, the millions and millions of people. Yeah, yeah, that no, they did well because of what he, he was offering. He, he couldn't afford it. But we can uh, afford Amanda, it. Uh, Amanda, you need to. They couldn't answer. Could they? I mean, I, I said right at the start, you know, what, what politicians do in these next 24 hours are crucial. And with Jeremy Corbyn, I so hope he doesn't fall back into his default of thinking what he led was a protest movement. Mm. And they had a fantastic rally yesterday. Mm. And it'd be great if we did another one next Saturday. And uh, let's keep going. <laughs> what I'd like to see is him actually acting as leader of the opposition and opposing. I think... And that means taking into account the, the talent and numbers he has in Parliament, in, among his MPs. It means reaching out to those and, and, the, and those reaching out to him, who've previously kept apart from each other, Chaka Muna and Rick Cooper and, and those. It also, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you, if, you, if you believe in shaking the system up, it means reaching out to other parties. Because if you look at it, Labour put their heart and soul into this election. They got a tremendous amount of new voters signing up, and they still didn't do it. Mm. And that's because the system now is broken. We've had tiny majorities of minority governments now for the last three elections. We haven't had any sizable majority for a party for the last 15 years. The Tories haven't had a sizable majority for the last 30 years. The system is broken, and it does mean that parties are now going to have to speak to each other. I mean, where I think that Jeremy Corbyn did resonate with voters is in authenticity. And I think one of the problems with Theresa May's campaign is she came across as very robotic. And frankly, if you behave like a robot, then the voters are going to vote for a clown instead. And let's be honest, oh, that is really? See, where... This is... Let, me, let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> Corbyn failed last night. We shouldn't get carried away. And you know what? A lot of Tories will be very happy if he stays on for another five years because he will fail again. He is unelectable. OK. What's up there? Yeah. Uh, just a minute ago, uh, members of the panel were very, very disrespectful to the people of Northern Ireland when you were slagging off the DUP. <clears throat> the DUP represent those people. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to slag off the, all the people who voted for Jeremy Corbyn. There haven't been any cuts. What? Every year, public expenditure what? is going up 10 or 20 billion. What? There hasn't what? been any austerity. Oh, there hasn't the, been any austerity? The, the government spends an okay. enormous amount 
It goes up every year. I'm Jeremy Corbyn is a very angry, misguided person who actually appears to believe they're being cuts. Compared to David Cameron, David Cameron was a reassuringly dishonest character. Had a great referendum, didn't he? <laughs> Chris, Chris Grayling, a reassuringly dishonest character in David Cameron, succeeded by Theresa May. What do you say to the point he's making? Twenty billion right. a year government expenditure goes up. Well, no it, it, it is absolutely the case that if you take the example of the National Health Service, we increase the National Health Service budget every year, and we always have in government, and we always will. In fact, the Conservative Party, through the years when the National Health Service has been in existence, the Conservative Party has been in power the majority of the time, and we've always looked after it and funded it. And our opponents will tell you the opposite, but the reality is we give it more money every year. OK, you in the front here. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say, um, I think there is a considerable amount of difference between someone that's good at campaigning and someone that can actually form a government and lead the country. And I mean, hats off to Jeremy Corbyn, he's a nice guy, he's, he's a good campaigner, and he's certainly a, a lot more sincere than Theresa May, but when it comes to the issue of who's going to lead the country, who's going to manage those Brexit negotiations, I think, the, um, I th I th I think it's, it, it kind of puts a lot more into context. And I, I, I don't think he... I, I can't see Labour going into government with well, him as well, leader. Is it better to, to, to put in charge of Brexit negotiations someone like Theresa May, who, who does a deal with the DUP uh, without actually knowing what it well, is they want? Well, you have to want? remember, she's yes. still got the largest party in government. Yes, her majority's reduced, but she still increased her vote share against, um, against Jeremy Corbyn. She's still got the most amount of seats. Yes, she reduced the number of seats, mm -hmm. but she's still got the majority. And with the DUP... No, no, I've just, I've, I'm not arguing with the maths. I was arguing with her competence. The, the woman here in the front. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think if there had been less anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, mm -hmm. party <clears throat> from people like Corbyn and perhaps you, Baroness Chakrabarty, that um, Corbyn would be in power in government? You want to answer that? I, um, I've, I've said everything that I ha ha have to have to say about that. There have been problems of racism and anti-Semitism um, in the Labour Party and in Britain, in other parties as well. But I, I don't really... I, I don't think I can attribute the, the election results to, to, to those issues. I, I, I really don't. You, you might, but I, I really don't. But just to answer the... the I know there the, were a lot of conflicted people who were... Jewish people who were unsure because of this. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, sad, I'm sad to hear that, but, but I think we're able to, to, to move forward together now. I've made some, I made some recommendations about how people ought to to treat each other and I, I feel that there's an appetite for taking taking those forward but to the gentleman who said Jeremy Corbyn is a great guy and he's decent and he's authentic he's a campaigner but he's he's not a leader I'd ask you just to to question what you think leadership is if it isn't about values and it isn't about authenticity <laughs> and it's certainly, it's, well, it's certainly it's certainly not attending vigils for IRA terrorists and bombers that attack innocent people Look, for their is, own political gains. And you have games. at least got to be able to lead your own parliamentary party. I mean, exactly. Shami, would you say that your party has provided high quality opposition in the last year? <laughs> I've got to respond to that. You make, you, you make a point about divided political parties and how you know, they're not going to be effective either in government or in opposition, that's clear. But I will say that I think during this campaign, another thing that has gone really well for us has been the unity of the party. In, in, I in look forward to seeing how that plays out. The well, so do in, I, obviously. You, sir, with the tie, the striped tie and the third seat in there, yes. I agree with um, Isabella Oakeshott. Jeremy Corbyn had the best chance yesterday to take advantage of Theresa May's weaknesses, a poor campaign, and he blew it. He failed. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean... And, and, and you, sir. You're shaking your head at that, yes? We talk about credibility of leadership. How can we have any credibility with reference to Theresa May to really think that she can debate, negotiate and extemporise with EU ministers and leaders when she completely avoided the debating platform during mm -hmm. the campaign. What kind of leadership does that show? Okay. Well, let's... let's uh, I'll come to you. Let's just turn... We've got ten minutes here. Let's turn to one of the issues in the campaign which did cause a lot of... Uh, well, a lot of debate. Uh, Angela Piercy. Does the election result uh, spell the end of the dementia tax? 
You remember the dementia tax, which uh, she said she hadn't changed her views about, and, well, that's a matter of debate, I suppose. Um, do you want to start on that, Isabel? Yeah, I mean, I think this is such an important issue, and I think it was really disappointing that the Conservative manifesto came out with such a botched approach to it. I think it's far too important for party politics. I know it's been tried before, but I think that we owe it to ourselves to have some kind of cross-party talks, some kind of commission where we really get to grips with this problem. It is going to be expensive, but it's too important for things to be labelled dementia tax or death tax. OK. Chris Grayling. <laughs> well, of course, the irony is there was, there was never such a thing as a dementia tax. And in fact, the package uh, compares quite favourably with the situation at the moment. I think most people didn't understand, don't understand, that the situation today is if you go into residential care and you have no other financial means, your house has to be sold there and then. Uh, and the money is spent down to the last £23,000. That's the situation today. It's been the case for 10, 20, 30 years in this country. What was brought forward in the Conservative Manifesto actually took less from people than the current system. But we've got to learn lessons around how that came across, how it was launched, about the communication of it. Uh, and we also need, I think, to do what we promised to do in the campaign, which is to issue a green paper, have a proper public consultation about the best way forward on this. Because Isabel's absolutely right. This is one of the great defining issues of our time. We as a nation are going to have to find the best way of solving it. It will mean some difficult decisions. And I'm pretty sure that Theresa, in the campaign and going forward, wanted simply to be honest with the public and say, look, this is a huge challenge. It is going to cost us collectively, individually, and we have to address it. Right. Um, why didn't she explain it then? Why didn't she go on television <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> debate, debate the pros and cons? I agree, it was a complicated... I was, in, I was on the daily politics with Andrew Neil and someone from the Institute of Fiscal Studies looking at the man Tory manifesto coming out. And they, these two great big brains between them couldn't work out whether this was a good thing or a bad thing or an easy thing to explain or a difficult thing to explain. And if they couldn't do it, I'm sure most of us couldn't do it. And I think that was the problem. But she had three or four weeks later in which to explain it and in which to take it on and to engage with you about it, find out what the issues were and the problems were, and she completely ignored that. You said uh, second seat there, yes. Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm actually more um, worried about the the risk of basically how many, more, how many more weeks will it take for the wheels to come off whatever agreement they're going to make, and we're going to be sitting here again discussing the yeah. same issues yeah. and going to the polls again. I'd, I'd like to know, you know what the panel thinks about how many weeks do you think that'll take to happen? What do you call the wheels coming off? Well, I don't know what agreement they've come um, done together, but obviously when you've got two people or two parties, uh, with the DUP, they'll, yeah. they'll disagree, the wheels will come off, <coughs> something was, will happen. I, I think, David, it was, the, um, it was the social care policy that actually made the wheels come off the campaign. Because I think it was one thing for Theresa May to say, I want a blank cheque for Brexit, which is why I'm having this election. But what that did was made people think, hold on a minute, she's trying to get a blank cheque for everything. everything. Yeah. And, Chris, the one other thing you've got, you know this, you, you've, the one thing you've got to do in a campaign, we're back to the question of competence. It was so badly handled. The first you guys knew about it was when you read it in the manifesto. It was done by her mate and two mates behind stage who are here you're all trying to get rid of, like Timothy and Fiona Hill, and they put it in there. And then it was launched on an unsuspecting world, and within a couple of days, she junked it. And don't think Angela Merkel and Macron and the rest of them didn't see how quickly she junked it either. And it's, it was just utterly incompetent when, as Isabel says, this is a really yeah. important issue where we do actually have to have a proper debate about it. Mm -hmm. Well, with respect, that's quite right coming from somebody in the party that brought us the extraordinary experience of Diane Abbott and police costs, yeah. of uh, Jeremy Corbyn costing his policies. So if we're on the subject of competence, looking at how badly they handled their ability to explain She's their the policies... She's the leader of a party launching a manifesto. This was a sentence... All right, all right. Uh, you can't spin your way out of that one. Right. Even, even you <laughs> Shami, Shami this, isn't just, <coughs> Shami. This, isn't just, this isn't just about spin, even about competence. It's, a, it's, a, it's about a policy that has terrified a lot of older people on the doorstep that I have personally spoken to. And it's a, and it's a strange policy from the Conservatives who are supposed to support homeowning and su uh, support are supposed to support, you know, that you leave your home to your children. There are, there are people who have been genuinely terrified and saying, I don't want to go into social care. Everyone's right that we've got a big problem with an ageing population. We need to take care of them with dignity. But that's got to be a fairer 
tax for everybody, not just taking the tax from the people who who, right. who are suffering and have to all go right. into uh, social uh, care. Uh, all right, fine. We've got, uh, we've got time for one last uh, question, I think, just. Daniel Ido, please. Given Daniel. that Jeremy Corbyn did much better than expected, is it fair to say that the power of the media is finally over? Uh, the media being... Or like newspapers like The Sun, The Daily Mail, who, you know... The BBC? Potentially, <laughs> yeah. The yeah, media's guys. power the in favour of general, social media so like or what? The, the, what? Sun, the Sun and Daily Mail in particular were very, well, mean, if you like, towards Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and I think it's been shown in the election yesterday. All right, so then, all right. Uh, Amanda yeah. Anucci. Well, I think we felt for some time that the way the newspapers have treated <clears throat> any, anyone on the left has been... Uh, a sort of a fiction. It's their own story that they sell. And I think most people know that it's their story. It's a, it's a, it's a fiction. Um, was it I, counted by social media in this election? It was. I mean, it'll take a while to find out how much, but I, I think it was. But, you know, the other parties will catch up on that as well. You know, the Conservatives and the, uh, the Leave campaign in the referendum last year had a massive social media, a very kind of slightly sinister one in terms of collecting data. Uh, and I think what it does is actually raise the whole issue of the influence Facebook and Google and, and those outlets have, that they are no longer just distributors of information. They are publishers, and they need to be uh, regarded as publishers. They publish stories for profit. That's just, how they work. Isabel and, and that raises that question, how do we now do that? I just want to get in here before Alistair does his usual rant about the Daily Mail. Mm. I think it's a perfectly legitimate question. It is really difficult to gauge, because when I saw the Sun and the Mail combined front pages yesterday, I really thought that might make a very significant difference. And actually, clearly, it, it did not. We will never know how much smaller the vote would have been. What did they say, um, these two pages? Well, they were both pretty robust in their hostility. I mean, I think, I think we found that um, Jeremy Corbyn was portrayed as a dustbin, um, and we were, we were advised to bin Corbyn, or don't let him put Britain in the bin. Um, but that said, I think they made a big difference during the Brexit campaign, so you can't kind of have it both ways. It's very difficult to judge. Chris Grayling? Well, I think the lesson for all of us as politicians is we cannot decide how we communicate to people. We have to look at how they receive their information. Uh, and a lot of work to do in the future on improving what we do with social media. Uh, but I think uh, Armando makes an important point that actually we also have to be sure that what is being put on social media is accurate because we want a democracy that tells the truth the Daily and a lot of time and a lot of the time <laughs> how often do you complain about that or are you accurate alistair you've got yeah. very good yeah. okay we've got a minute that. let's not spend it better than yours yeah we've you got, got a minute we've got a minute fake news on the internet is a let's problem so much better let's than not we spend it all on the daily mail very briefly it's not just about being accurate it's sometimes just about being fair and giving people a fair shout and a fair hearing and it's also about nastiness, and I just think there was something, there was a moment perhaps in this campaign where, where some of this attack stuff just went a little bit too far oh, I, on I, social media I, and okay. in the okay. Okay. Uh, uh, brief point on this. We've got ten seconds for this. I think it's possible actually that the mail in particular was so over the top Here we go. that in the last few days it actually helped the Labour Party because I think the public have seen through it, and I do urge you all Thank you for uh, encouraging me to do this, Isabel. I do urge you all, if you really want a healthy democracy, stop buying the bloody Daily Mail. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I don't know why we have to go on about the Daily Mail all the time, but anyway, our time's <laughs> up. Uh, next Thursday, we're going to be in Coventry. After that, we go to Plymouth. If you'd like to come along, there on the screen is how to do it. Call us on 0330 123 9988. My thanks to this panel. And to all of you who came here from London until next Thursday from Question Time, good night.